Hello everyone and welcome to Text in the City today in this cold Melbourne weather. My name is Ruby J Murray and I'm delighted to be here for this second last of our series in Text in the City where we take culturally important and critically significant books off the Year 12 VCE English list and invite people in to talk about them. Today is a really special day because we are doing The Rugmaker of Mazari Sharif and we actually have the authors here with us to talk about it. Um, before I introduce them, I'd like, you to, I'd like to remind you that we're going to be opening the floor for questions at the end of the session, and we really invite you to ask questions about the book and the process of writing it. And especially for the school students, remember that this is stuff that you can put in your exam. So get in there or you'll be regretting it in November. The Rugmaker of Mazari Sharif traces the life of Najas Mazari, who I have up here on stage, through the years of conflict in Afghanistan as a child and a young man, and then on leaving Afghanistan in 2001, across his long journey through Australia via Pakistan, Indonesia, Ashmore Reef, and the Woomera Detention Centre. Today, Najaf sitting next to me is a successful business, Melbourne businessman, a storyteller, an advocate for asylum seeker welfare in Australia, and runs a charity as well, the Mazar Development Fund, which provides medical and educational assistance to some of the poorest villages in Afghanistan. The Rug Maker of Mazai Sharif was co-authored in 2008 by the wonderful Robert Hillman, who is here on my other left side, and followed in 2007 um, with Robert again by The Honey Thief, which is a collection of Afghan folk tales. Robert is the author of more than 80 works of fiction and non-fiction, which blows my mind. His autobiography, The Boy in the Green Suit, won the National, um, Australian National Biography Award in 2005. And um, I guess I'd like to start by asking you to how you met and how you chose each other as well, because this is a very intimate project. You might need to pull your microphones in towards you so we can all... Yeah, there we go. Well, Najat, would you, would you like to give your... Your version first. <laughs> you can go ahead. <laughs> um, okay, Najaf, <coughs> Najaf and I didn't know each other uh, before I, um, uh, a few until about six, six or seven years ago, but we had a mutual friend, and that friend, who was a publisher, knew that Najaf had a story that he wanted to tell, an extraordinary story of survival, uh, a journey, one of those remarkable journeys that. Uh, start off in despair and end up in a type of triumph of the spirit. So she knew that Najaf had a story that he wanted to tell. He didn't have a writer. She knew I was a writer. She brought us together. She introduced us to each other. Um, I met Najaf in his, in his wonderful shop in High Street, Paran, his, uh, his uh, carpet and rug shop. <clears throat> and I hadn't, didn't realise it when he was talking to me at first, but he was interviewing me. Um, <clears throat> I thought, you know, we're just having a sort of a, a chat. He gave me some Afghan tea, and uh, all the time that I was talking, he just asked me various questions about myself and, and the books I'd written. All the time that I was talking, he was watching me in this piercing way, uh, with his eyes fixed you know, right on my eyes, you look like Ezekiel. And uh, I thought, I'm in trouble here. I, I must have said something that's offended Najaf in some way. And he, <laughs> but actually, he was just judging what I was saying, the sincerity of what I was saying. He was going to tell me his story, and the story had many things which Afghanis would normally keep to themselves, very private and personal. Any suffering... Afghanis, particularly Hazara, don't usually talk about them to other people, uh, to strangers, because it's uh, as if they were complaining. Um, so if Najaf were going to talk to me in a very intimate way, he had to trust me. And after 20 minutes, he, he reached across the table and took my hand and said, you're the one. <laughs> so why did you want to write this book, Najaf, given that it's a difficult book to write and it's such a personal book. Uh, thank you, Ruby. Uh, there, I have a few reasons I start this book. Uh, uh, the first, uh, when I come to Australia, before I come and I have a, I s hear a lot of propaganda when my, I was in my own country in Afghanistan. And uh, when I come here, actually, I found out a lot of propaganda was about Muslim countries and about refugees. And I hear this is a lot. And uh, just, I said, okay. Why people leaving their hometown? Why become a refugee? Because it is very painful when you're leaving your uh, hometown, you're leaving your family or uh, friends. It is not easy. And 
I said, okay, I start uh, my uh, own story in this book uh, and uh, make a little breach to people who don't understand about this uh, refugee who don't understand about Muslims to I write my story while leaving my hometown. Uh, the book I started for first myself, and uh, uh, of course it was a dairy language, and I, have a, a, I was another writer, and I have a very short uh, education, uh, you read on the book, and uh, at my village. But of course uh, I can, cannot continue my education because uh, I, uh, I lost my father when the age of eight. After that uh, I was grew up in my brother's house. And uh, then I become a, uh, my brother moved from the village to the city. And from there, uh, I, my second education is like a skill. Uh, then I started this book myself at uh, that time. Uh, I was, uh, I was the same myself at the, inside the shop. And uh, I have a full democracy. That uh, when sometimes I'm talking about democracy, like uh, my wife was not with me. And then uh, I found out it is very hard for me to continue this book. And I started with my Australian mom, Robin Burke. And then unfortunately she's got sick. Uh, after that, I, I know uh, Katie Lewis, who was the inside publication. She was the director. And it is me to Robert. When uh, I meet Robert, uh, I have to be very uh, careful when I'm talking to Robert as well, and I have to be careful with the books because I don't want to uh, someone take wrong advantage from my book to use for their political purpose in Australia. And uh, I said to Robert, uh, because when I'm talking to Robert, of course I was keep looking, he's not a politician. <laughs> and uh, I said to him, uh, this book I'm writing, this is my own experience, but uh, I, I'm not a politician. And uh, it is, of course, it's a half of politics, but it is personal. And uh, fortunately, we become a very good friends. And the other reason was, I said, I promised to God. Is I said, if the book is gone good, and the income of the book, like a, like a loyalty of the book, I want to start an ambulance for my village because in my village don't have a, about seventy. Uh, it is region. It is about seventy thousand people live there. Have a no in ambulance. And fortunately, uh, it has gone really good, and the book's gone beyond VC. I never thought about the VC. I don't know what is the VC meaning. <laughs> and uh, when the publisher came to me and said, your book's gone on VC, I said, I don't know what is the meaning of VC. He said, year 12, I uh, have to study your book. And fortunately, uh, I met a very good Australian friend in the meantime. Uh, Ed Australian friend together uh, come together and we established the Mazar Development Fund. And I'm proud to say our first ambulance, 2011 model, brand new, has arrived in my village. And it's been chosen for the VCE list because it has so many themes of conflict in the book. There's the conflict inside yourself about leaving and about coming and going and then the conflict between um, yourself and other people and then the conflict between groups and nations as well. And what do you think, the, what was the biggest conflict for you when you were writing the book? What was the hardest thing? Uh, especially the harder things was uh, when I'm talking on the book was uh, uh, to have a two or three place was very uh, uh, difficult was for me to talking, especially when I'm talking about my older brother, when I lost him because he was also like uh, my father. And also uh, when the other difficult part was about talking about my mother, because when I got injured, my mother was shouting on the street. This part's difficulties uh, I found out, but I tried to be control myself and I tried to be give it. But uh, the other one is, uh, uh, when my mother died in 2004, and uh, very hard for me to put in the book because uh, I couldn't see her. And uh, the, also, I don't want the book to become, a, uh, I don't want to become too sad. Mm. It's an amazing job that you've both done too with that fine, it's such a brave job walking that fine line between tragedy and comedy and hope as well. How was it getting that voice how did you develop that voice? Is that Najaf? You, is that you? Does it sound like you to you? <laughs> yes, you uh, actually, when uh, I 
I was kept talking on the book when also the books when finished. I found out it was like me and really Robert done great job is he really used his skill and the end of the book when the end of the chapter has finished the book uh, you believe it or not Ravi I was crying myself <laughs> <laughs> how did you do it Robert what techniques did you use obviously there's the structural technique you've used of going having Australia in the present and Af Afghanistan in the yes. past and that's sort of like weaving almost too that's like a rug the story comes in and out how that, did you that's how true. did you think Israel, of that Israel. I hadn't thought of it that way until you mentioned it, Ruby, but it's true. It is like that. Um, if you're writing uh, somebody's story in their own voice, uh, you, it's, it's necessary to, it was necessary for me to listen to Najaf really, really closely, pick up the cadence of his voice and uh, his vocabulary. From that point, I was able to sort of enhance it a little bit. So the voice in the book is, you might think of it as, if Najaf could write in English as fluently as he can write in Dari, this is what might emerge. So it's a slightly enhanced version of, of uh, an enhanced version of Najaf's English. Um, nevertheless, when, when people read it, people who know Najaf uh, read it, they think this is Najaf, this, this, is, this is him. Uh, and uh, Najaf himself, as he said when he, when he finished reading it, he only put it all together, the, the story all together. He only saw it, he saw it chapter by chapter, but when he put all the chapters together and then read it from beginning to end, and he phoned me up to tell me that he was crying, um, and uh, at first I was, I was worried, but then I realised that, realized that they, were, they, were, they were good tears, that um, he'd, um, he felt convinced by his own story. And we, never, we rarely get the opportunity to see our lives uh, all between two covers, you know, uh, with, with a lot of the um, uh, extraneous things taken out and some of the themes and patterns made to emerge more strongly. If you read your own life story like that, you are likely to, 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 to think, you know, my God, this is, this is the life I've lived. And that's what happened to Najaf. You've chosen certain images in the book, um, which come through again and again. Birds are quite strong as an image in the book. Why did you choose birds and what did they mean to you? Is that something you did or something that just came up in stories? Did you mean when they released the birds? Yeah, <laughs> releasing the birds. <laughs> uh, you know, if you uh, go to look close to any detention center in Australia, you can, if you look from a uh, little bit far, far away, and you can see it's like a cage. Like a view was a kind of birds was locking inside the cage. And it was the middle of the days, it was, uh, uh, when you go against a detention center, also it is very sad because uh, four gates will be locked on you. And when you're releasing, uh, also it is uh, crying and it is sad for you because a lot of your friends are still behind the bus and living there. But when I, uh, I come to uh, Melbourne and of course my visa was a temporary protection visa and uh, I cannot do anything with uh, only can work here but I, I cannot uh, fly uh, from the country. And I, cho I choose the birds. I said okay, I cannot fly at least. and. Uh, I was buying the birds from the uh, Chapel Street, the pet shops, and bring it in, and one male, one female, and uh, give him some water in or some food, and then I release him together, and I said, uh, I'm living on temporary protection visa, but at least I have enough power now to give you permanent visa, <laughs> and you can fly. And when the bird, bird was flying, uh, honestly be with you, it was so make me, from inside I was feeling so happy, at least I thought, I released uh, a bird from the jail to release it, uh, give him freedom. That was making my feel so happy. But unfortunately, the, the person who's selling the birds, they found, one day they asked me, what do you want to do with this too many birds every week you're coming buying? I said, I, I love birds and uh, I want to keep in the birds and also I want to give some for my friend. And one day, when I bought the birds, I was walking out of the shop, and this guy was walking behind me. I didn't saw him. And this time, I didn't release, on the back of my shop, I released next, very close to my shop, it is called Victoria Park. And I went to the park, I said, okay, this, this time release him inside the park. When I released, this guy saw uh, the birds, I said, it is not good. The big birds eating, the small birds. <coughs> and I said, if you go to the jungle, if you found a thousand, thousand birds, that means all of them is the big birds already eat it. 
I said, I took the risk, I come to Australia, but now the birds have to take the risk, go to their, found their own place. Mm. <laughs> it does sound like, you actually do sound a lot like the book, it's true, <laughs> but, you can hear it. But after that, I buy a fish. <laughs> And I was buying the fish, uh, I said, because I cannot buy any more birds. <laughs> and I take the fish to release in the, uh, it's, uh, the water, uh, and I found, found out the fish is small, we had live in a small place, and uh, the, I, most of them was, was, I was walking and to release it, uh, the birds, uh, sorry, the botany garden. And uh, one day I was uh, walking uh, uh, with the fish, and uh, <laughs> when I have the, the so the other people all have a question, but one question I was laughing to because I, was, I have to answer. Said, the lady said, it's a beautiful fish. I said, yes, Australian people talking, uh, walking with the dogs, and I'm walking with the fish. <laughs> <laughs> but last year I got a phone call from my students, and said, are you Najaf? I said, yes, I am. Said, don't release the fish in the pot and the garden. I just saw it, the fish is dying. <laughs> but the fish was running for a long, long time ago. <laughs> So she saw, she saw a fish floating in the water in the Botanic yeah. Gardens and assumed that was the fish you'd released about seven or eight years earlier. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> There's an inherent um, pacifism in the book and a, so many statements about non-violence and what it means to be a non-violent person and how you can be non-violent even in situations where everyone is violent. Do you think that some people are violent and some people aren't? Or are we made violent by situations? You see, Rubia, it is a really good question. Uh, racism bring racism, and fundamentalists bring fundamentalism. And also, depend the families. And uh, uh, like I talking before about my older brother, was he was uh, very kind. He was very peaceful, and he is a pacifist. And uh, he all the one thing he said to me, uh, really, I I remember that thing. He said. If some people do it wrong, if you do the opposite, same thing, that means nothing, to, nothing different between you and the other person. And uh, how he tried, to be, he tried to be not joined with the politics and with the communists or the mujahideen, said if you join with the one of them and you kill someone, uh, some son or someone's father or someone's family members, you see in Afghanistan, say, and when we become young, we have to support the rest of the family, not like a, here, like Australia. If the children become young, then the parents said you should go and you build your own life. But over there, we have, we have a different. I said, don't destroy someone's life. And I said, each time, if you want to become a good person, if when you walk, if someone fighting or someone's violent, you just sit there and look at, uh, and you can really, you can see, if you become at the same same thing as the other person, that's nothing is different between the others. It's better to be try to do the opposite. So it's about choosing all the time and yes. making conscious choices. Exactly. As far as this book goes for you, Robert, this is a conscious choice to engage in politics in the country you were born in, in Australia, how, how has that choice been, um, from that, how have you made that political choice and what brought you to this sort of a choice? Uh, Ruby, in, uh, like a lot of Australians, in, in, uh, after the Tampa, the whole Tampa thing, um, I began to think more about refugees and the reception they received in Australia and I felt very, very ashamed. Uh, but I also thought maybe something's happening in Australia now that we will always regret, that we'll look back on in years to come and we'll say to ourselves, what was I thinking? Why did I not see? Um, and I, as a writer, I wanted, to, I, was, I was hoping for a project like this, like this project uh, with Najaf. Um, and uh, when it came along, my, my first my most immediate desire was to write something like a firebrand, <laughs> you know, to write something that was full of my politics, full of the passion and intensity of my politics. And it, meeting Najaf uh, was very, very good for, uh, for, the, for the way the book developed because uh, Najaf said, we're not doing this. We're not, it's not going to be a, uh, um, uh, it's not going to be your politics. It's not going to be you standing up on a pulpit and lecturing the uh, the the, um, uh, the readership. It's going to be a, my story, and politics to me are something which are very very personal. I might speak about my politics, Najaf said, to my family, but I would never 
it would be an offensive thing to, to Najaf to go and stand up on a stage like this and start <coughs> talking in a declamatory way. So it forced me to, uh, in uh, writing the book, it forced me to write the book as a creative writer, uh, to create it as a, something which a reader would enjoy reading in the same way that a reader might enjoy reading a, a novel, um, with a, a dramatic tension that carried you along, symbols plotted throughout the, throughout the story, and um, uh, the chapters starting in a way that made you want to continue to read them. So that was all thanks to Najaf, because he ruled out me becoming a, writing the book of a firebrand and, and, and telling all the people of Australia exactly what I thought, the way they, I thought they should behave. There's a very powerful element in which the story does this for itself, though. I don't, the, the story really does speak for itself mm. in many ways, and it is incredibly striking the way that Najaf has managed to keep out of that politics, too, to make the personal so political, mm -hmm. to use a good old feminist um, statement there. It's crossed a lot of waters, that, that statement. Um, and I wanted to well, look at all these. I've got so many things that I want to ask. We're going to be opening up for questions in a moment, um, though, about after this. So please keep them in mind, because I won't get to ask all these. Or otherwise, I will, and you won't get to ask yours. Um, about conflict, again, as a creative process, um, and how you've how that's felt for you. Has conflict become something creative now? Or had, how has the book changed you, I guess, or changed your values or changed who you are? Has it at all or not really? The book, How It Changed Me? Yeah. It is, uh, of course, I found a lot of uh, changings because uh, just uh, at the moment, uh, uh, fortunately, every week uh, I got a few bookings going for a talk. <laughs> and uh, last year I got sick. And uh, last uh, all year, uh, like Robert knows, I got sick here, yeah. and uh, I don't want to continue uh, doing talking uh, to a school, a library, book clubs. And uh, just a, a few months ago, uh, I got another booking from a school, and uh, said to me, "Come for a talk." I said, "I'm sorry, I cannot more talk because my health is not very good." And the teacher is gone. Teacher is, was friend of my other friend. I talked to the friend. Said, "Najib cannot come for a talk." And uh, the, then my friend came, he was a Greek man, said, Najaf, maybe God choose you to send you to Australia. And now I choose you to go to talk. A lot of people don't understand. And to better, you do continue your talk and uh, go ahead. I said, OK, if it's my talk can help someone, now I have to go continue, my, start my talk. But it is sometime when I go for a talk, it's also uh, bring a lot of uh, uh, the difficulties for myself as well because my English is not so good and people want to ask me questions and sometimes I get the difficulties. But uh, and uh, for, for, fortunately I try to be each time when I go for a talk or uh, a lot of people say to me you're now famous or this, this. I said no, I try to be quiet as I can. I try to be uh, not so proud or not this because I believe I'm a guest in this world and I'm uh, sooner or later I will be die for what is I should be proud or for what is I should be showing myself so important. No, I said I come from the desert. We were born on the desert. We're going back to the desert to pay back for this when I try to be a good uh, person. Yeah. Ruby, I, I wanted to say Najaf and I talked to a, a, a lot of uh, students at school, um, and uh, we always I always start off by emphasising that conflict in all of our lives is the great creative in, in human ex creative uh, agent in human experience. Uh, even in Najaf's life, in spite of the fact that uh, the story told in the book, in spite of the fact that he suffered terribly at the hands of. Uh, people who are beating the daylights out of him, um, and uh, the, the warfare and violence. Most of the conflict in the Rugmark of Mazari Sharif is actually creative. Najaf works out a way. There's conflict within the, um, uh, within the canteen. One person is uh, dishing out more, bigger, bigger shares of food to his particular Iranian friends than to other people. Najaf solves it. He finds ways of of, um, of uh, uh, finding resolutions to conflict that bring about a creative outcome. And that's actually the way it is in all of our lives. So in the, in the, in the first chapter of the book, where uh, he's, it starts with conflict, where he's in the Woomera Detention Centre, 
He's walking around in a wretched way. It's the first time in five months he's been able to sit down. He's been running and running and running. He's wound up in the, the Woomera Detention Centre in Australia. He sits down, he realises that his heart is broken. It's his first realisation. What's this pain? My heart's broken. I've left Afghanistan behind my wife, my beautiful baby daughter. The resolution to this conflict that he finds is poetry. He sings a song. The song is poetry just set to music. But he uses poetry to resolve the conflict. And that's typical all the way through the book of the way in which he finds resolutions. Releasing the birds is using poetry to uh, resolve the, the feelings of conflict in his heart. And again and again he does that. He's essentially a poet. And uh, that was one point that we wanted to make in the book, that conflict is resolved with imagination and poetry often. On that beautiful sentiment, I would like to ask the guests of the Wheeler Centre to ask the guests of these world any questions that they might have around the text. There's one hand that's straight up up the back there. And please a reminder to turn off your mobile phones too. Um, yeah. Um, how did uh, your religious views change when you came to Australia or affected? How, how, are your religious, how is your religious views affected or changed by coming to Australia? Uh, I don't think it's changed. Uh, uh, I continue my practice here as, uh, the same as I was practicing in Afghanistan. But uh, I got more uh, uh, understanding about different, different uh, religion uh, here compared to Afghanistan because uh, nothing has changed. If you see uh, my friend, uh, uh, not just a uh, religious view, uh, you know, when a lot of people, uh, I'm not sure from which country uh, you come from, uh, a lot of people when going back, uh, like uh, for example, uh, uh, when I go back to uh, Afghanistan, I've been last year as well, about uh, the organization. And uh, I sit with my family, with my friends, the water they drink, the food they eat, I try to be, eat this, everything the same. Right? And uh, one day my friend told me, Najaf, when you come from Australia, uh, you like you never been to Australia. You never never been to European countries or Western countries, because another people who's coming from Western countries, they don't drink the water from the water we drink. They drink the water with the bottle. I said no. I am the same person. It's gone. I'm the coming back to the same person. Depend the person. Some people change. Some people not. But I, nothing has changed inside me. I try to continue my tradition. But I try to continue my culture. But it's. At the same time, I try to respect the other culture, the respect to the other religion as well. Was there another question up there? Oh, there's one up the front here. And then one up the back, was there one there too? Afterwards? Thanks to all three of you. Um, as someone who was brought up as a Christian and became a pacifist as I confronted the government's instruction to fight in Vietnam, that that destroyed my Christian faith. Could you tell us a little bit about your pacifism and Islam and what is the conversation between pacifism and Islam in your heart? Uh, that is a good question. You see, like a few months ago, the person was burning Quran in, the, in America. Uh, I didn't mix that a lot of people who a lot of Christian was helping me here and not looking in one face the person who was burning the Quran over here that not means every Christian was uh, involving there for the war and uh, for example in Vietnam or in, in the moment in Afghanistan but please do not look the Muslim the face of Taliban or the face of Osama Bin Laden no, they are a politician, they are a fundamentalist, and not their uh, uh, anti-Christianity uh, or Buddhism or uh, the other. They also, if you look in Afghanistan, uh, uh, the Taliban was burning their own schools, especially uh, when uh, the girls' school. It is, I believe it is totally wrong, you know. Uh, I don't believe this is the first thing is uh, they are a Talib because the Talib is just study uh, instead the uh, Quranic school study. They are a poor people. But Talib don't know much to run the war 
they have uh, the, on the, big, the background, I believe, different game have to use the Talib's names. <coughs> the first time when Talibs come in, uh, our tribe leader, his name was Abdul Mazari, they said at the time, they are not the real Talib. But I'm not looking myself as uh, what the, uh, our Taliban is doing, what the Osama Bladen was doing. No, uh, every religion is good, depend the person. <laughs> Is there another question? Year 12s, come on, you know you've got them. That was one. And then there's another year 12 up the front here. Um, in your view, what, uh, in your mindset, what is the biggest aspect of conflict in the book? That's a good question. Sorry? What is the biggest conflict in the book? What's the most important conflict? You, you know, always, uh, uh, Really, really for me, uh, I, I told many times Robert as well, I think Robert can answer always I have a little bit difficulties about the conflict. Uh -huh. Yeah, the, the meaning of the conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I put this one to Robert, and uh, Robert can answer. Robert, what's the biggest conflict <laughs> um, in It's the conflict for, that's in Najaf's heart at having to leave his, his native land and come to Australia. It's consistent. It's all the way through the book. There are other conflicts, uh, sort of more sensational conflicts, such as when he falls into the hands of the Taliban commander and he's terribly uh, put, goes through a terrible ordeal. Yes, that's conflict, but in a way it's sort of a crude conflict. The more subtle conflict that Najaf feels is what we would all feel if we were also violently forced to, to leave, uh, uh, in a violent way, leave our, uproot ourselves, leave our native land and go to a country in the world. We wouldn't even know when we left our native land what country it was going to be. Najaf had to find the resources within his own heart, within his own character, um, to deal with that conflict every single day. And the way in which he did it, of course, makes the, makes the story. You respond to conflict according to the person you are, according to the character you are. Because Najaf is fundamentally, essentially a, a poet, um, with a poetic way of looking at life. Even Islam is a, an extremely poetic way of looking at, uh, at, at our existence. It's, a, it's, a, it's itself, the Quran is itself a sort of a, a monumental work of poetry. Najaf uses poetry to negotiate that ongoing conflict. And there was a question up the front here. We might just have to wait for the, um, for the microphone to come. Sorry, just a second from my left. Thanks. I was just wondering how the education of girls is going now in Afghanistan. That was a question about the education of girls and in Afghanistan. Uh, like I said before, uh, we are, I believe more education for, uh, uh, especially for women in Afghanistan. Uh, because if a woman is educated, more, that means the girls have a, uh, the, the children have education. But in, uh, education is fortunately is, uh, going really good in northern Afghanistan and the center of Afghanistan. It is still have a problem in the south where the Taliban is operating. At the northern area, it is going well, fortunately, because I've been last year and I'm going again in September. And uh, uh, hopefully, uh, because the ambulance are up there, this my trip is uh, have a two special trips. First, the am launching the ambulance to the uh, to the people, and the second is I'm try to find place to open a, uh, a school for children. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, fortunately, fortunately, I got fund from United Church in Houghton. Uh, it's not a big fund, but it is something better than nothing, and it at least helped me to start the education for children. Yeah. yeah. Other questions in, from the audience? I wanted to ask about um, violence again, and you mentioned violence is a very crude form of conflict, and in the book, in response to that good question at the back there, how do you think we should, how do we go about avoiding violence in situations like that you've been in, Najaf, which the violence is so extreme and there's so much of it? How do you stop that violence? It's, Seems uh, mind going to even confront. It is uh, unfortunately uh, the wars keep going in Afghanistan. Uh, a lot of the mass of the wars also coming from uh, foreign countries, but the the main problem is in Afghanistan. Unfortunately, we don't have a much education, and the children is at the moment the children is born at the fighting, and grow up at the fighting still uh, is 
cannot say 100% Afghanistan safer, but uh, because the violence keep going because of have less education, that's the main problem. Mm-hmm. And the other is uh, uh, violence is in Afghanistan or uh, mistrust each other. As unfortunately, we have an injustice government. If you want to come on the power, not leave the other tribe to come to join the government. This is unfortunate for our country. Mm. Robert, do you have a response? Yes, I think that uh, violence is the the solution to conflict that emerges from the impoverished imagination. Nothing could be simpler than to try and resolve a, a, a problem with a bullet through the head. Um, But with more imagination, you would see that this is no foundation for for building a civil society. Um, Imagination would take you past the the solution of of, of using the bullet through the head, using violence. What can we say? Some people are imaginative and some people aren't. And the fact that we have been able to build in, in many countries in the world, not in Afghanistan at the moment, but in many countries in the world, Societies which function according to uh, uh, an accepted set of uh, laws, many, many, many laws, uh, that work as a sort of a network. Um, Australia is like that. Australia, in many ways, uh, has a type of beauty about it in the civil society that it has that it's created. There's a type of beauty in law, a beauty in the in the the belief in resolving uh, all conflicts without resorting to violence. In Afghanistan, we hope that they will get the opportunity, will get the relief from relentless 2,000 years of warfare, get some, enough relief and enough confidence in themselves to begin to develop a society in which if somebody is killed, it's because of an individual act of murder. It's not the policy. It's not uh, uh, somebody prosecuting a political campaign. It's just random murder. And um, <coughs> got... I- I wanted to ask you both what you wanted people to take away from this book. If there's one lesson that you want people to take away from it, what would it be? Mm. Uh, the most of the, the, the good things of this book, uh, the, you, every one of you knows, I told this one everything from my heart. And uh, if, for example, journalists go to Afghanistan, very hard to at the scene or bring the real news from Afghanistan because when you go there, uh, protect with the high security. And then stay one week or two weeks and then bring the news from Afghanistan. A lot of the, the news is very hard to bring the true news. I, I come from this country and you, I mention everything from the, in the book from my culture, about the politics, everything. The other is... Uh, uh, I request the people at the same should when refugees coming to this country, they of course they're not coming with the empty hand. Then they not bring money with them. They bring a skill with them. Uh, like a, if you look myself, uh, 2001 I come to this country, and 2002 I opened the business. The reason I opened the business I have a, a skill with me. I don't have, I have, I come with a $250, but I have a skill and I opened the business and the business really going very well. And I should understand about the people who are leaving their hometown. Mm. Um, well, Ruby, I didn't uh, uh, want people to, the, my, my overwhelming prior, priority in writing the book, once I calmed down and decided that I wasn't going to write a sermon, uh, my overwhelming priority was to write a book that people, it sounds odd, but people would enjoy. I wanted you to read it from beginning to end, from first sentence to last, and put it down without feeling uh, feelings of despair and thinking, you know, what's the point? What's the use of living? I wanted people to feel that Najaf's triumph in taking himself from Afghanistan to Australia and uh, uh, making such a flourishing life for himself in Australia uh, was uh, a triumphant thing, a triumphant thing that required a lot of good fortune along the way, but also uh, great courage, stoicism, and a big heart, a big heart. I wanted people to see that. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. Okay. Uh, the other thing is, uh, when I'm, I'm saying about the refugee, I, of course it is, uh, for me, it's difficult to say too. And uh, just uh, last month I was talking to MRIT University, and when you're supporting the refugee, for example, and taken to your house, 
and uh, of course for two three months or four months if you're keeping in our house if you don't charge him the rent or electricity bills or food uh, after the should 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 charge him should charge him and not uh, give him free for everything uh, otherwise the person become a refugee and losing their future <coughs> This is, uh, I'm uh, requesting the Australian people. Uh, the reason my business uh, gone good to the other, because I put myself in difficulties and I have uh, my own experience. And uh, the first, when I, I use Australian Centrelink two week, when I found the job, immediately ring the Centrelink, I said, I don't want money. And then when I opened the business, I used Centrelink uh, six months. After six months, I ring the Centrelink, I said, don't want money. I said, if I keep using the Centrelink, I'm sleeping down inside the room, then I become lazy, I will be losing my future. And fortunately, uh, I, I did hard work, and the business is now going really well. We're going to have more applause right in a second. Too. I'd like to thank you both for coming here today and for writing a book like this as well, which is so important for us to have on the VCE list and as a space to discuss these issues too. And thank you all guests for coming as well. Next week we have the last text in the series, um, city series with Atonement. But for now, please join me in thanking Robert Najaf. The Honey Thief is out now. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you Ruby.